I'm only trusting the L2 to provide me the nice stuff. I'm not trusting it to provide me the core stuff, the, mm. the core property rights and censorship resistance that Ethereum is going to give me. Welcome to Bankless, where today we explore the defense of the Ethereum roadmap. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. The Ethereum roadmap has been called into question recently. I think uh, Bankless has aired some of these dissents. And I'll say maybe two things about that before we begin. First is this. I think dissenting opinions are really important for us to consider. And uh, David and I will continue voicing them on Bankless. And even when they're wrong, I think at best they help sharpen our ideas. And uh, both David and I would rather err on the side of open engagement than live in an echo chamber. So that's the first thing. The second is this. I just think we have to recognize, yes, this all this roadmap angst recently could totally just be a price thing. As we know in crypto, narrative follows price. And when price is down, people find all sorts of reasons to doubt their conviction. And on this, time will tell. But today's episode voices a counter to the doubters on the Ethereum roadmap. Mike Neuter is an Ethereum developer and a previous bankless guest. He thinks the Ethereum roadmap is like pretty great as is. It's right on track, in fact. His message is that we should stay the course, play the long game, and watch the value of ETH grow as a monetary asset as the Ethereum economy grows across all sorts of layer twos. I think there are some open questions that remain at the end of this episode. The core question that I think the industry is asking is, is Ethereum's roll-up centric roadmap a queen sacrifice blunder or a queen sacrifice end game victory? And I think all three people, me and Ryan and the guest Mike, on this pod today are pretty assured that it's the latter. Uh, and this episode illustrates that end game win scenario for Ethereum. But still, nonetheless, a second question remains. Does the roll-up centric roadmap produce sufficient moneyness for ETH? So if we're sacrificing layer one execution, we're consistently going to expand the supply of DA far beyond demand. What is the structure that's left for ETH to become money? And is the network of chains that the roll-up centric roadmap blossoms enough to create ETH as money? I think these are kind of the questions that I'm now pondering. Uh, but I do also enjoy uh, this idea that Mike uh, echoed a couple times in the podcast that he said also comes from Dankrad, which is first, Ethereum needs to create value. Developers need to use the block space that Ethereum is creating to create value for the world. And only then will ETH become money after that. And it kind of reminds me of the Vitalik take in 2017 of did we deserve it? Uh, ETH will become money uh, if Ethereum deserves it, I think is one possible interpretation of this. So let's go ahead and get right into this fantastic episode with Mike Neuter. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, like our preferred crypto exchange, Kraken. If you do not have an account with Kraken, consider clicking the links in the show notes to getting started with Kraken today. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24 seven to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. The Uniswap wallet is officially the preferred wallet of bankless, and it's the one we use anytime time when we want to transact on chain. Whether you're on your browser or on the go, Uniswap Wallet makes it easier than ever to swap anytime, anywhere. Use your wallet to transfer funds directly from a top centralized exchange and tap in thousands of tokens across Ethereum and over 10 other chains like Base, Arbitrum, and Optimism. Uniswap Wallet delivers deep liquidity, fast execution, and reliable quotes with zero gas swaps through Uniswap X. And when it comes to security, you can rest easy knowing it's backed by Uniswap Labs, one of the most trusted teams in DeFi. Their code is open source and independently reviewed, so you know it's Protected. So why wait? Download the Uniswap wallet today on Chrome, iOS, and Android. And don't forget to claim your free uni.eth username directly in the mobile wallet. Start swapping smarter with Uniswap. The Arbitrum portal is your one-stop hub to entering the Ethereum ecosystem. With over 800 apps, Arbitrum offers something for everyone. Dive into the epicenter of DeFi, where advanced trading, lending, and staking platforms are redefining how we interact with money. 
Explore Arbitrum's rapidly growing gaming hub. From immersed role-playing games, fast-paced fantasy MMOs, to casual luck battle mobile games. Move assets effortlessly between chains and access the ecosystem with ease via Arbitrum's expansive network of bridges and on ramps Step into Arbitrum's flourishing NFT and creator space, where artists, collectors, and social converge and support your favorite streamers all on-chain. Find new and trending apps and learn how to earn rewards across the Arbitrum ecosystem with limited time campaigns from your favorite projects. Empower your future with Arbitrum. Visit portal.arbitrum.io to find out what's next on your Web3 journey. Bagless Nation, very excited to introduce you once again to Mike Neuter. He is a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. I think the last time we had him on, we're actually going through the details of the Ethereum roadmap. It's a fantastic episode. It's called yeah. Endgame 2.0, where we go through all the sw swim lanes. Longest Bankless <laughs> episode ever. Yeah, it was, right? It's like three hours plus. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was a fantastic episode. Mike, welcome to Bankless. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Um, again, I feel like I say this every time I, I'm on the show, but it's... This was like a huge part of, of what got me into crypto and, and being on here is always a real treat. So uh, that's super yeah. cool. Uh, okay. So um, Ethereum is one of the things that got me into uh, crypto as well. And so the, the topic <laughs> of today is the Ethereum and the Ethereum roadmap. And I want to set some context for the conversation we're about to have. So uh, David and I have recently had some episodes in the podcast that have really called into question the Ethereum endgame, the, the roadmap. Um, a roadmap that has optimized the roll-up centric view, layer twos, that kind of thing. Kyle Samani was a guest we had on. He, he basically says, this prioritization, this roadmap is the reason why ETH is down so bad relative to other assets this cycle. And he has his own bag bias, maybe, and uh, his own preconceptions, of course. And we also had an episode with Max Resnick, who uh, is a, a protocol developer as well. And his take was that the Ethereum roadmap is off track and uh, went through an episode with him where he sort of describes it. Now, your take I think is contrary to those two takes. You think the ETH roadmap as it is, is pretty great. We're going to discuss why you think that, but let me start with the broadest of questions. Why is the ETH roadmap great? Yeah. So I guess I'll start by kind of setting the, setting the framing for, for this episode. And I guess I wrote this article called Ethesis, which is a, a portmanteau of like ETH and, and thesis, right? So uh, this is kind of my first stab at having a, a bigger picture understanding of, of what makes Ethereum valuable as a platform and also like considering Ether the asset kind of along a bunch of different men dimensions, including um, the roll-up centric roadmap. So that's kind of like where we're at. And I do want to say kind of before jumping into to kind of how I think that this is very much a personal opinion, like that is kind of a, uh, an op-ed of sorts. And so I don't want to like say that I'm speaking on behalf of the EF or on the, the whole Ethereum community. This is just like one person's perspective, but um, yeah, hopefully can can help voice some of the arguments that um, that I think are true and that a lot of people might might resonate with. So yeah, I guess to start the, the kind of framing I used in the article was uh, settlement, DA, execution in that order. And so Max brought up this really good point, which is, you know, we only have a limited amount of kind of bandwidth, both, both in terms of how much network capacity we can handle, like kind of on the physical layer. But then there's also this like this bandwidth in terms of what we as an Ethereum community can ship in terms of protocol upgrades. Mm -hmm. And so kind of I think it, it's totally accurate and valid to to be thinking a big picture about how to prioritize upgrades and changes. And in, in my article, I say that I think settlement is kind of first and foremost the priority. This is kind of the fundamentals of of ETH as as properties, digital property rights. And a lot of that take was kind of inspired by the, by the bankless thesis, triple point asset thesis, et cetera. Um, then the second is kind of a deep dive on DA and kind of beyond just thinking about DA in terms of fees and in terms of the value accrual to ETH asset, I think it's also worth exploring some of the nuance of DA in terms of what it provides to rollups, in terms of composability, in terms of network effects, these types of things. Um, and also just like making abundant block space and kind of as we usher in this new era of truly decentralized access to to this blob space and block space like what what could be built out in the future and then execution kind of as as the third thing but still very much a something we should consider doing um and that's kind of focused on l1 execution how how that plays into the the future of zk and and scaling the base layer um and that's relationship to i guess maybe more of the value accrual arguments that that people are very familiar with in terms of 
um, the burn, et cetera. So yeah, I'd say that's kind of the the flow of, of the argument and, and what I hope we can cover today. Yeah, I think this episode does assume some knowledge. So we're diving right into, you know, 300 level uh, Ethereum <laughs> mm-hmm. crypto content. So uh, Bakeless listener, we'll, we'll include in, in, in the link some resources where if you don't know what settlement DA and execution kind of are, like some other episodes that will help you out on those terms. But I think in order to dive in the deep end of the pool, we, we have to, um, you know, assume some common knowledge across bankless listeners uh, today with with those terms. And I'll just note that you said settlement, DA, and execution in that order. That That's roughly what the existing Ethereum roadmap kind of prioritizes. And I'll contrast that with you know, what Max and uh, others uh, have been uh, kind of saying, which is like, okay, we did some settlement in DA. Now we have to go swing back towards execution and really focus on that for the Ethereum layer one and make that a priority rather than settlement and data availability. So they would probably reorder what you just said and probably put <laughs> execution first. Uh, is that your impression of uh, their message? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and I would say this type of kind of reversal and, and pendulum swinging back towards execution is totally valid and totally worth considering. But it does kind of fundamentally suggest the question of like, where do we expect user activity to take place? And I think kind of one of these core tensions that Max was was getting at in his post or in, in his kind of writing and, and in the podcast was he very much wants like all the future of DeFi to take place on Ethereum L1, right? And so if if that's the premise, if that's where your starting point is for kind of viewing the Ethereum roadmap, then I totally agree with him. You have to start optimizing the L1 for execution because as we've seen, like activity is moving to the L2s and it is moving kind of away from the base chain. But I think the core thing that that I disagree with him on and and kind of I would reject a bit in terms of that premise is that you can get the scalable execution on the L1 without compromising on the settlement and kind of the decentralization of the L1 in the first place. So mm. his argument kind of rests on the assumption that multiple concurrent proposers and and braid and these kind of like new cool technology ideas will help keep the same level of decentralization and, and censorship resistance of the base chain while still allowing it to scale up. And I think, you know, if that turns out to be true, like if if that ends up being um, being something that we can all agree on, then like full steam ahead, like let's go. But where I would push back is like, if we have any reason to believe that we're compromising on the decentralization and the kind of core premise of censorship resistance on the L1, then that's like a trade-off that doesn't make sense to make in terms of kind of like almost trying to to give up what we're good at um, and and chase something that that we're not good at. And, and that feels like the fundamental pivot that would be kind of a strategic mistake as, as an ecosystem broadly. As we say kind of higher level in the, in the first part of this podcast, maybe it's useful to kind of articulate what the main goal of the Ethereum rollup centric roadmap is, what the North Star is. I think if you go and you you look at that, uh, those five different swim lanes of the Ethereum roadmap, the Verge, Burge, uh, Scourge, uh, all, all the urges. Splurge, Surge. Splurge, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's pretty easy to kind of get lost in the sauce of like what each one of these things is doing. Oh, there's five different lanes, five different goals. Um, maybe you can weave these the goals of Ethereum together. How would you describe the actual main goal of the roll-up centric roadmap? What, what, what is the North Star? Yeah, I think right now, the the North Star is growing the amount of economic activity that takes place in the Ethereum ecosystem. And in the Ethereum ecosystem kind of includes L2s, rollups specifically, that that use Ethereum DA. And so Donkrad had this really awesome point in, in a recent AMA where he said, like, before we can start thinking about um, like value accrual or like why ETH, you know, is going to be a long-term valuable asset, we have to think about value creation. And that value creation is going to come from people actually like getting on chain, using using digital assets, swapping, sending money across borders, et cetera. So yeah, I think kind of first and foremost, the the goal here should be to onboard more users and to increase activity on the L2s. And if you look at L2 beat, like things are looking great on on that angle, right? You look at like number of transactions, active addresses, um, volume on the L2s, and and it's kind of like nothing but up and to the right. So I think that's that's fundamentally where where we start. And that's, in my mind, still like the the number one goal of, of what Ethereum should be doing. And that's why when we're looking forward to the kind of next phases of these hard forks, stuff like PeerDAS, stuff like full dank sharding, which continue to optimize for like creating this abundant block space are, are still very high on the priority list. Because I think everyone's under the assumption that sure, like DA is cheap right now, but we're going to hit this point of growth where 
Ethereum needs to keep scaling the DA fast enough to keep up with um, the demand for that block space. So yeah, I think kind of fundamentally increasing the amount of economic activity in the in and around the Ethereum ecosystem is is the goal right now. And and I guess the the last thing I'll add here is that the kind of core principle of preserving the neutrality of Ethereum block space is the other kind of counter argument for and and kind of the the force that is also working in terms of making sure that you know MEV doesn't result in a highly centralized and, and censored chain. To maybe articulate what uh, I think you said, um, uh, we created uh, with Bitcoin, we created this thing called block space, secure block space. Uh, now, ever since Bitcoin, we've been learning what to do with it. Then the Ethereum uh, project comes along with smart contracts and we can do even more things with block space. Uh, and I think maybe what to, what you're saying with, with uh, Dankrad's take is, uh, well, with you know cheap data availability with layer twos, we have so much cheap block space, and now we have surface area for people to do things that create value for the world with this thing that we've created called block space. Uh, and optimizing for value creation by leveraging secure block space is the correct north star of the Ethereum roadmap. Let's increase the Ethereum GDP by giving people, block space consumers, the tools that they need to create as much value as possible using the quali the high quality block space that Ethereum has. And in order to preserve high quality block space, we need to have strong censorship resistance mechanisms. We need to make sure that MEV doesn't corrupt the chain. Uh, and that's why we're kind of focusing on some of the things that we're focusing on in 2024. Is that is that a, a way to articulate um, the summarized point? Yeah, exactly. And I think there's also kind of a nice element here that comes in, which is as scaling kind of increases on the L2s and as as some of this tech evolves and, and ZK EVMs continue to kind of increase at this, this astounding rate, some of that execution scaling and kind of the, the more long-term futuristic, I guess, uh, sci-fi chain stuff that Justin would talk about can, can kind of come into the fold um, kind of as it becomes ready. So I think, again, this is like part of Ethereum superpower is like, the ability to kind of scale trustlessness and scale decentralization while still absorbing all of the awesome open source tech and and kind of magic cryptography that, that gets built out in the system. Mike, in your article, you call um, the essence of Ethereum property rights. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a lens that we certainly enjoy. Uh, property rights, I don't think, uh, was a big part of the Ethereum white paper. I don't know how many times this idea of property rights was mentioned in the early days of Ethereum. Uh, but nonetheless, you're calling it the, es the essence of Ethereum. Uh, so what does property rights have to do with Ethereum and how is it just aligned with this North Star uh, that we were just uh, talking about? I don't think it was used in the white paper, not because it's, um, it's like a difference in, in fundamental views, but more so like we have a different terminology and a different language to understand the mm -hmm. same thing, which is um, kind of First and foremost, self-custody, right? Like this is the main thing in my mind that differentiates, like one of the core things that differentiates assets that you hold on a blockchain versus assets, assets that you hold at a bank, right? It's, you know, you'd have to come to, to someone's house and physically take their, their private keys in order to, to seize their assets. Secondly, I think property rights as, um, as a focus of what actually is the kind of measurable thing you get from decentralization, right? So decentralization was always part of the kind of core Ethereum vision. And I still see decentralization as mostly a means to preserving credible block space. So, you know, it's great if I can self-custody my ETH at my house and I have my private key, whatever. But in order to actually like make use of the chain, in order to send someone ETH, in order to, to kind of participate in this online economy, beyond just like storing the and self-custodying the ETH in a cold wallet, I also need to be able to send transactions. And, you know, neutrality of Ethereum's block space is kind of this idea that if I want to send a transaction, like no one can can choose to exclude me from that financial ecosystem. So yeah, I would say the kind of first and foremost thing is self-custody, but also being able to interact with the state that Ethereum creates and the, the economic platform that it services is like a huge part of what it means to like maintain and preserve property rights of of digital assets. I think David and I have always seen Bitcoin as like also a property right system and but like a property right system that does one thing. It uh, secures and preserves the property right of Bitcoin, right? <laughs> it's a narrow like, property right. It's <laughs> kind of like a, a mono asset platform, right? Yeah. And yep. so it's sort of a narrow view of, of property rights and this whole kind of meme around 
uh, digital gold. You know, the question of like, well, what secures the digital gold? And and the answer is a uh, Bitcoin block space, right? This is yep. uh, different than gold in the physical world, where you have, you know, uh, the periodic table of elements that that makes it, uh, you know sort of uh, censorship resistant. It's like impossible to go reproduce gold uh, without expending more energy than just yep. like kind of like mining it in the first place. And of course you can um, custody your gold uh, in your house and you might guard it and you might put it in a vault or you might bury it and hide it in various places. And so that's kind of a cost of the system. Anyway, um, the, the traditional way in meat space that we've um, preserve property rights for for bearer assets as as we've tried to like secure them um, by force. You know, you have a a, a vault or you have uh, guards with guns, uh, and in um, of course the, on the internet in the digital world that's not possible. And so we we created this product called Bitcoin Block Space, which can now uh, secure Bitcoin. Well, Ethereum does that with. All sorts of assets, like any type of asset, not Broad just- Broad property rights. Yeah, right. Not yep. just a, a single store of value asset, although it has that, it's called Ether, but any token that you might want to spin up. I guess though, there are some limits uh, in terms of things that we can't fully secure on a property rights system like Ethereum. So we have these kind of crypto native bearer assets like, like Ether and the various uh, ERC-20 tokens that are only native and only available on uh, the Ethereum network, but there are some limits. There are some things that we can't secure on uh, Ethereum. So what types of property rights can we secure on Ethereum? What are kind of the limitations here? Yeah, for sure. So I think you're totally right in calling out that kind of crypto or crypto native assets are like the kind of most permissionless and most sovereign of, of all of these crypto assets, right? Like no one can actually take away my Ether without getting the Ethereum network to agree on an invalid state transition or or coming and taking my keys. Now, uh, obviously, like, I think the elephant in the room in terms of assets that that live on the Ethereum blockchain but are are clearly not imbued with the same level of property rights are, like, things that have a real-world component, right? So the canonical example of this would be stable coins. There's also, like, a kind of broader push for tokenization of real-world assets generally. Um, but... Once you kind of make that bridge between the digital space and the real space, like there is a bridge between the bank account that Circle has and, you know, the the USDC token that's on chain, you kind of, you do have some reduction in the, in the property rights. Like there is a counterparty here, which is Circle, right? So Circle is ultimately the ledger of record for USDC, not Ethereum, right? Because if I have some USDC and Circle decides like, I'm going to take away Mike's USDC, they can do so by, by just you know, turning off the transfer button on my on my USDC. So yeah, I I do think it, it's like very important to acknowledge that a lot of the value that's stored on on blockchains does have this counterparty risk. And, you know, in order to truly scale permissionlessness and and kind of true trustless value and um, value creation, we need to lean into these these crypto native assets and and hope that they continue to get used. Um, like obviously maker and and DAI like was the original idea for this you can kind of collateralize a, a stable coin obviously they have some real world components in in their design now that that kind of changed the the counterparty risk there but yeah fundamentally i see i see kind of the digital native assets the crypto native assets as as the core value of of the kind of economic system that we're creating so with this uh, property rights frame of reference, maybe we can bring uh, bring back up like censorship resistance and C uh, Caesarship Caesarship resistance. Uh, why are these things <laughs> important uh, when we have this brand new like property rights system? Because like so much of Ethereum's time over the last like two years, the EF researchers has been around like censorship resistance uh, and uh, things like MEV, which you know some people perceive MEV as just like backdoor theft. Uh, so why, why is resistance to these things so important here? Yeah. So, uh, when I started my article I, at the very top, I put a quote from Hayek, who's like one of the original Austrian economics thinkers. And, and I'll just read it and he says, what our generation has forgotten is the system of private property is the most important guarantee of freedom. And obviously like this kind of leans more into the political economy and the kind of theory of personal freedoms and liberties. But I definitely do believe that a huge part of modern society is like having access to to private property and being able to store that value without having the risk of 
kind of an authoritarian regime or someone with a gun coming, uh, like someone who has a monopoly on violence, um, kind of taking away access to your to your value. So, you know, I always come back to the to the Canada trucker example because I think it was it was just so shocking to me um, because they were they were trying to like exercise their free speech and that free speech got taken away by the seizure of their assets. And, you know, I, a few more examples that I think are super relevant and I actually heard about through your guys' podcast. Um, first was Cynthia Loomis who came on your show a few weeks ago and she was talking about how she was debanked basically after her her husband passed away suddenly. And just like, it shows you, and and I know you guys were were also debanked at, at some point when you... Mm-hmm. You, you as a company, yeah. like, are not able to function. And, and you know, as a media company, like, that's that's sort of taking away your freedom of speech, right? Like, if you can't spend money on um, equipment and you can't pay your utility bills and stuff, then, like, fundamentally, any capture of, of your property takes away your freedom of speech. And and that's fundamentally, like, the civil and kind of human right that that feels like it's really important to preserve, especially under today's regime. Like I think it's, you know, maybe over the past 40 years, kind of, especially for people who live in in the US, like this wasn't really a concern. And I think a lot of people have a very similar opinion about um, privacy of their own data, right? It's like privacy of your data is not that different from having property rights over your over your money, right? Like if you're willing to concede that the government can can read anything you write and you know, you're like, I have nothing to hide, why, why should I be worried about it? Then I think um if you kind of view that only from the lens of being in a, a highly developed country with like a strong, you know, rule of law and and like a strong currency, then yeah, it, it might not make as much sense. But like we're seeing that huge amounts of crypto adoption are actually taking place in in places with more authoritarian regimes or like weaker currency. And so, yeah, I guess fundamentally these things feel like they might become more important in in the world as we kind of move into this maybe less stable period with um, less clear like mono power in the US. Um, and yeah, I think I, I think this type of stuff is it doesn't matter until it's the only thing that matters and and property rights feel like fundamental as as a human right. So your answer, Mike, to the question of like, why has Ethereum really prioritized seizure resistance and censorship resistance? Y- your answer is to increase the settlement assurances for the property that is held inside of Ethereum and all of the economy and transactions that are tied to it. It's all about property rights and increasing the settlement assurances. So if I have Ether and I want to send it to somebody, I know that there nobody on earth can actually stop me from doing that. That's basically the summary of why Ethereum has prioritized these these two features. Right. And the kind of core, I guess, underlying assumption here is that if you give up on decentralization, you give up on that strong settlement assurance because you open um, some surface by which either like a nation state or a, a giant corporation can control the outcomes of this of this economy. So, yeah, I think that's kind of the fundamental grounding of of decentralization and why it makes sense for Ethereum's roadmap. I think the the first part of this conversation that we've had so far has just been kind of just like restating why Ethereum is important, why we're all here, why we align with this project that has this grand arc that we've been following for years and years. Uh, and this idea of just like unlocking property rights for the internet has like pilled so many people. It's why we have this podcast. It's why you're at the EF. Uh, really, <laughs> really great like foundation for I think what we want to talk about next, because there has been some parts of the Ethereum roadmap that I think haven't been formally like integrated into a lot of people's mental models that have been developed in the past. Like we have the triple point asset, we have ultrasound money, roll up centric roadmap, uh, and we haven't really integrated roll-ups very well in our content sphere on Bankless yet as it relates to this idea of property rights or the property rights layer of the internet. Or, you know, said differently, we haven't really integrated how do roll-ups fit into like the 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 value accrual mechanisms for ETH. Uh, now that we have a roll-up centric roadmap, how does that change the triple point asset or like ultrasound money? So I think that's what we want to do. And then this next part of this conversation is like really unpack in 2024, what do rollups do to these pre-established mental models that we've covered so much in the past? Uh, and so maybe we can start with there. Uh, how do rollups 
expand Ethereum block space? Uh, and is that also the same thing as expanding Ethereum's property rights system? Because we have two different things here. We have property rights, and then we have Ethereum block space. I don't know if those are one-to-one -one equivalent. Are those the same things? Are those different? And overall, like, how do rollups fit into this like model for understanding Ethereum? First and foremost, we should consider how the uh, L2 consumption of Ethereum block space imbues some similar censorship-resistant, seizureship-resistant properties on L2 assets. And kind of fundamentally, how I think about this is the rollups are effectively represented, some of their state is represented on Ethereum as this canonical bridge. And the assets that live in that Ethereum space are able to be used in the, in the rollups because when you, you are sure that your rollup assets have the same censorship-resistant properties that they would have on Ethereum L1, right? So there's kind of two components to this. First, there's becoming a stage two rollup, and we can maybe talk about some of the details there, maybe not, but this is kind of around the details of the smart contract bridge itself and who has the permission to upgrade the bridge, who has permission to upgrade the state. These are fundamentally things about like the representation of the assets in the bridge and how those assets can be withdrawn. Mm. The second thing is the kind of force withdrawal mechanism from L2 to L1. And fundamentally, I see this as kind of like the freedom of movement for your L2 assets, right? And this is this is very much the same as kind of what we were talking about earlier with a bearer asset on Ethereum where I can send it and I know no one in the world can stop me from sending it. In the same way, if I have an asset on an L2 and that L2 has this forced inclusion mechanism, I know that I have that same right, which is even if the L2 starts censoring me, even if all of the L2 operators collude against me and decide like, I want to steal that guy's money, they are not able to do so. I can bridge my body down to the L1 and, and kind of take my, take my assets elsewhere. So those are kind of like the core ways that I see L2s as inheriting Ethereum's security and Ethereum's censorship resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, kind of... And therefore property rights. Like those two things come together as like, okay, Ethereum is offering assurances on property rights. Yeah, exactly. And so given that, now I think the L2s have like a more flexible design space over how they provide users what kind of the daily users want beyond those two core things, which is fast transactions, good onboarding, offboarding, yeah, the and sexy very stuff. low fees. Yeah, the sexy stuff, right. So, you know, as a user, I could be a lot more comfortable knowing that like most of my activity is going to happen on the L2, so long as I know I still have my like core self-sovereignty over the assets themselves. And I think, you know, in the long run, that's going to be very important because some L2s that don't inherit the security of Ethereum are going to end up with decreased property rights for their assets. And this actually happened already, right, on Blast. So mm. there, was a, there was a hack on Blast. Everyone talks about it as if it was a good thing. And I think it, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, but this Munchables protocol got hacked for $60 million. And, you know, they basically communicated with the, with the hacker and said, hey, um, we're going to update the, the contract and, and take away your money. And they just sent it back. And so it's kind of like, okay, this is a weird dystopian end game where we're like doing this hostage negotiation through Etherscan. But <laughs> that just doesn't feel like an actual like thing that should be able to happen if I'm right. using an L2. And I'm, I'm trusting the L2 to kind of, I'm only trusting the L2 to provide me the nice stuff. I'm not trusting it to provide me the core stuff, the, the core property rights and censorship resistance that Ethereum is going to give me. So, so currently, um, let's say, do layer twos provide the same property rights as Ethereum's layer one block space? You, you kept using this phrase, uh, stage two. And of course, if people want to understand what that means, they can go to uh, L2B, which tracks kind of the, the stage progress of all of these layer twos. And the case that you just mentioned, Mike, with Blast, Blast is basically stage zero. Okay, yes. it's like along its decentralization journey. So it has the ability, does does not have the property rights of uh, the Ethereum mainnet, has the ability to, to censor, has the ability to kind of like freeze in some respects. But all of these layer twos should be on a journey towards uh, full stage two, which imbues them with property rights that are similar, maybe not equal to, but pretty similar to the, the, the guarantees of Ethereum layer one block space. Now, there, there's a, a few things we could get into there in terms of like some people doubt whether layer twos will actually ever get to stage two. 
Um, others uh, don't think that stage two actually imbues the same level of property rights as, as Ethereum layer one. But let's let's park on this for a second. Can we define what exactly stage two actually means and how a layer two achieves that and whether the, any of these are close? Stage two is is fundamentally asking the question of what does it take to change the L1 contract that represents the view of the L2 according to the bridge on Ethereum's L1. Said differently, is it like stage two is like, what kind of control does the Ethereum layer one have over the Ethereum layer two? More like what type of control do people in the real world have over the bridge that represents the state of the L2? Mm, mm -hmm, right. So, you know, right now, basically being able to upgrade that contract is essentially the equivalent of, of being able to play God, right? right? Like if you bridge your assets into that contract and then someone just upgrades the contract to send all the assets to their own account, then your property is is gone, right? right? And and that's something that is kind of like fundamentally broken about having contracts that are upgradable, um, at least upgradable in the sense that they are now. So Vitalik kind of laid out a few what preconditions need to be met in order for a contract contract upgrade to happen. Mm -hmm. um, one of those preconditions is you have multiple client implementations that disagree on the state given the same set of transactions. So this is kind of like using the multi-client approach to say, hey, if there's a bug and we don't actually know what the new state is, like then we defer back to a security council where they can upgrade the contract. And like, so this is almost kind of like a, a worst case scenario fallback mechanism to, to save everyone's assets if the bridge is, is giving mm -hmm. wrong results. He also lays out some ideas around like if the rollup goes offline for seven days, then you kind of give, this is kind of like the rollup is stuck. It, it's no longer live. You need to kind of grant access back to the to the bridge operators, to the people who run the actual rollup to, to upgrade the um, the contract. And then I guess the third bullet, bullet point he, he lists in there is that upgrades can happen, but only after like a long delay, such as 30 days. And the idea here is that any sort of long delay like this would uh, offer the the roll-up consumers time to decide if they're going to bridge out or keep their assets in in that L1 contract, right? So fundamentally, I like have this choice where it's like, I see the upgrade happening. Maybe they're going back to stage zero. Maybe they're going back to blast mode of operation. I don't think I'm comfortable with that. So I'm going to do my exit and they give me like 30 days to, to kind of inform myself and make that decision. So obviously like, in in some ways, this isn't purely the same as being able to just like lock away your ETH and and not touch it for 20 years and then wake up and and you know move it kind of trustlessly. But I think the level of property rights that you can get at stage two are so close that it'll be like, you know, equivalent in in many regards and and enough for people to trust using the L2s fully. So yeah, this this whole like stage zero, stage one, stage two thing. And also if we opened up layer 2B and we looked at all the pie slices that are either red, orange, or green, these are all uh, measures of an individual's property rights on this layer two. And so like yep. whether a layer two is at stage zero or stage two is a statement about how strong one's property rights are on this thing. And then you can, again, you look at the pie slices and if they're all green, then like your property rights as an individual are like pretty damn strong. If, if they're all red, then your property rights as an individual are pretty all weak. But all of this is under this North Star umbrella of just like evaluating property rights across this layered stack, right? The bridge upgradability and the stage two, stage one, stage zero stuff we were just talking about is kind of imbuing seizure resistance to L2 assets. Now, there's another very important thing to consider, which is actually censorship resistance of those assets, right? So the, the path here is I have some ETH on Ethereum mainnet, and I bridge it into the contract. And now I'm operating on the L2, but the only person who's able to sequence L2 transactions is a centralized entity. And they decide that they don't want to process my withdrawal request. Like I have 10 Ether in there and I want to withdraw it. And they just, I send them the transaction and they just drop it. They ignore it. Now, the way that rollups are designed to protect those assets and to give back that censorship resistance of the L1 is this idea of a forced transaction inclusion mechanism. So this is called different things on, on the different stacks, but the idea is the same, which is I can post a transaction to the L1 and know that even if the L2 sequencer ignores me and continues to ignore me, as long as that transaction lands on the L1, my withdrawal will get processed and I can take my Ether out. And so this is kind of the fundamental protection against any arbitrary 
sequencer ignoring my my wishes and kind of censoring me on on that access. So kind of with these two things combined, the stage two trust uh, or stage two ability to like um, trust that the contract can't get arbitrarily upgraded. And with a, the guarantee that I can always land a transaction on the L1 that will bridge my assets out from the L2 contract, I have like such bulletproof properties for my assets in the L2 that um, they're functionally equivalent to assets on the L1. Mike, do you have a doubt that um, layer twos will actually achieve stage two? So that this is something that that Max said basically that that's not incentive compatible. They they don't have the kind of the motivation because it sort of destroys a you know uh, MEV revenue model for them. It, it was interesting that uh, I saw recently that Vitalik is kind of applying some social pressure to layer twos and, and you know tweeting out that he's not going to be talking about layer twos unless I think they achieve stage two. Is it stage one or above? Like something to this effect, stage they're getting above, closer yeah. to, to stage, stage one two. and above. Yeah. Okay, so it's one and above. So and at some point, you can imagine Vitalik saying, "Hey, I'm not going to talk about you until it's stage two. So that's social pressure, but it's um I get I guess a, a bit of a, a stick. Uh, take and it's you know he can't compel them uh, to do this. So w- what about Max? Take that you know L twos aren't going to actually you know, move towards stage two. So that would be nice if the reality you said was true, but it's just not going to happen. So yeah, this is actually a really common misconception, which is stage two doesn't say anything necessarily about the decentralization of the sequencer itself, right? So. Stage two has this component of how can you upgrade the contract, and this forced transaction inclusion mechanism is about what happens if the sequencer is is censoring you. But the actual decentralization of the sequencer is kind of deprioritized in this in this stack ranking of things. And Vitalik actually mentioned this specifically in the the recent edit, uh, Reddit AMA, which is to say, you know, it's fine if the if the sequencer is still centralized, is still collecting. MEV and like this is kind of more of a question around like how can the sequencers compete to give the best execution to the users because fundamentally like the users are going to vote with their feet and they're going to choose wh- whatever gives them the best execution but the kind of important thing is that all of these sequencers compete on the same level playing field of they give the same property rights to the assets underlying those transactions mm. so yeah I, I actually fully agree with Max when he said um, you know there's no incentive for the L2s to decentralize their sequencer. I kind of agree with him. Like fundamentally, a a big part of how I view their business model, and I think you guys have said this before, is they're kind of reselling block space, right? They're marking it up. They're providing goods and services that that make it more consumable for the average user. But fundamentally, like they have to make a profit somehow. And I think the sequencer is is a natural way for them to to make a profit. And you know, the the ultimate decision around which L2 to use will come down to like which L2 can provide the best users, the best features for the users, not which L2 can provide the best property rights. Yeah. So I like to think about it as like, as long as they all have the same kind of core fundamental security, then the the kind of extra add-ons are are what they should actually be competing on. So you're you're agreeing with Max in that you're saying that the incentives to decentralize the sequencer are simply just not there, but you're also making a, a kind of a broader point, a higher level point, which is that well, decentralizing the sequencer is actually not a core condition that we need to have our rollups uh, be set for. That's not a, a bad benchmark to compare to because actually just maybe we're actually kind of just conflating this idea of, I know like centralization is kind of a bad word in our industry. Uh, and like, why, of course, why don't you want to decentralize the sequencer, bro? Like, why do you not like decentralization? <laughs> like, why do you, are you a centralization maxi? Maybe you can kind of unpack this take a little bit. Like, De- decentralizing the sequencer, like important, not important. Like why, why do we want this? Why don't we want this? Unpack that take a little bit. Yeah, this, this is kind of maybe a, a personal opinion, but in my mind, sequencers should be centralized because they rely on Ethereum for decentralization. So mm. like, why would a sequencer kind of double down on the thing that Ethereum's already best at, which is providing strong property rights, instead of kind of working in a more symbiotic way and kind of doing what Ethereum is not willing to do, which is be fast, be slightly more centralized and offer people better better user experiences um, and kind of like merge those two things to, to make the most kind of complete full flow of, of interacting with these systems. So yeah, I guess Max in his podcast, I'm, we're picking on him a lot, but 
Hmm. I think it's it's worth going through. You know, he basically said, oh, we already have we already have like permissionless consensus, like the L2s should just run a proof of stake network. And that, that's like how they should naturally decentralize their sequencers. But I don't think that actually makes that much sense because basically what this involves is taking away some of the core value add features that the L2s have in the first place, which is like, you can give 200 millisecond, you know, confirmations. Like that's just not possible if you have to do permissionless consensus. And the level of permissionless consensus kind of no matter what would be worse than the consensus that's actually taking place on Ethereum, right? So it's like you're trying to do what Ethereum's doing, but you're doing it at a worse level. And to what ends? Because you're not actually giving people better um, kind of long-term property rights and and store value properties for their assets. I, I think he would say here that like, maybe we're giving them better real-time censorship resistance. And I, I think there is a world where maybe that's that's worth exploring, but kind of from a first principles perspective, I don't see why um, decentralized the sequencer in the mean, t- in the kind of near term, is actually something that that needs to happen. Yeah. So I think what you're doing is you're kind of just stacking the idea of a decentralized layer two sequencer set is like one of the many things that all of our layer twos are all going to compete on, and to whatever degree that having a decentralized sequencer set is valuable for the users, is valuable for the block space of that layer two, is something that that layer two can compete on. But there's also nothing fundamentally wrong with having a single sequencer. In fact all of the technology around optimistic rollups and fraud proofs and ZK rollups uh, is all about enabling a centralized sequencer set without compromising you know, individuals' property rights who use a centralized sequencer. It's actually kind of just like, you can actually have your centralization, but have all the benefits of a decentralized network that is keeping that centralized entity in check. Would you agree yep. with, with that vibe? Yeah, exactly. New projects are coming online to the Mantle Layer 2 every single week. Why is this happening? Maybe it's because Mantle has been on the frontier of Layer 2 design architecture since it first started building Mantle DA, powered by technology from Eigen DA. Maybe it's because users are coming onto the Mantle Layer 2 to capture some of the highest yields available in DeFi and to automatically receive the points and tokens being accrued by the $3 billion Mantle treasury in the Mantle reward station. Maybe it's because the Mantle team is one of those helpful teams to build with, giving you grants, liquidity support, and venture partners to help bootstrap your Mantle application. Maybe it's all of these reasons all put together. So if you're a dev and you want to build on one of the best foundations in crypto, or you're a user looking to claim some ownership on Mantle's DeFi apps, click the link in the show notes to getting started with Mantle. Launching a token? Don't let complex legal and tax issues slow you down. Toku provides specialized support to optimize your launch and ensure that you as a founder and your team and your investors get the most tax efficient outcomes. The Toku team understands the crypto space inside and out and will ensure your token launch is fully compliant while maximizing tax efficiency. Toku can connect you with the best attorneys if you need them to make sure that you have the best advice and Toku can help to optimize your taxes so you pay the least possible amount of taxes while still maintaining legal compliance. With Toku's guidance, you can concentrate on building your company while Toku handles the logistics. Token launches don't have to be complicated. Talk to Toku today to get a free initial token valuation. So Mike, these property rights, the, these settlement guarantees that we get in layer twos, right? Um, do all of those things come into play when layer twos are using Ethereum for settlement? Or do they also have to use Ethereum for settlement and DA, which is data availability that we've been been talking to? Like, if they don't use Ethereum for DA, do they get the benefits of censorship resistance and seizure resistance that we've been talking about? Or d- d- does this pristine property rights uh, settlement assurances only come into play if, if they're kind of like doing both layers of the stack here? The answer here, as with many questions about like L2 constructions, is, is quite nuanced. So I guess first and foremost, the only way you get the kind of the exact level of, of censorship resistance and seizure resistance that we described before was to have Rollup actually post its transaction data to Ethereum DA because of the forced transaction inclusion mechanism. So you can have a stage two, kind of going back to the, the first part, you can have a stage two rollup that the contract has not has no like a upgrade ability that uses external DA. And mm-hmm. now you know that like, there's still no one who can kind of arbitrarily, capriciously upgrade that contract and take away your assets. However, if you process transaction data to an alt L1, you don't have the guarantee of forced transaction inclusion. Ah, and the reason for okay. that, the reason for that is because in order to prove that my transaction to do the withdrawal is valid, I need to know what the state is and be able to say, like, my transaction is valid after the current state. So basically what would happen 
is if um, if someone was trying to block the forced transaction inclusion path for someone on a DA or using a rollup that uses an alt DA layer, they could say, hey, I posted a new state route to the L1 contract, but I'm not posting the data to the alt DA layer. Mm. Now, this is only possible because the alt DA layer is different than an Ethereum blob. So when you actually are using Ethereum blobs, you can't upgrade the state, you can't update the state on the, the bridge unless it's corresponding blob with the commitment to the transactions is there. So now you don't have that, and you have this kind of optimistic path where you say, I'm assuming this state update is valid, conditioned on the fact that the transaction data actually is available on this alt DA layer, mm -hmm. right? If the, if the transaction data is not available on that alt DA layer, then there's no way for me to prove that my transaction is valid and my assets are frozen in the L1 contract. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is kind of a doomsday scenario because fundamentally what's happening here is um, the L2 you know, is, is effectively losing its liveness. It's shutting off permanently. And the moment it starts posting transaction data again, then I can do my forced exit. But there still is a path where, you know, someone who is is posting that data to the alt DA layer stops posting it and all the assets within the L1 contract are frozen and seized. And so uh, different DA layers, uh, we have like Celestia, for example. Maybe everyone feels good about posting DA to Celestia. Celestia is a pretty robust network. It's meant to receive DA. Uh, but also that DA layer could also be Google. Like Google is, is part of the uh, consortium of, I think, like Arbitrum Anytrust. Uh, and, you know, Google, super centralized entity, maybe it wants to withhold data for whatever reason. Uh, and so maybe that would change users' appetites for what kind of assets that they would elect to hold with Google. Uh, maybe they only want to hold their, like, World of Warcraft currency with uh, Arn Arbitrum Antitrust, which is also what Arbitrum Antitrust is, like, optimized for. It's optimized for gaming. Uh, but they also, maybe they don't want to hold their, like, CryptoPunk or their Ether or their, you know, life savings with any data availability that's from a centralized entity. But also, nonetheless, anything that's not Ethereum DA is a new dependency that does not exist if it would otherwise be Ethereum DA. Uh, and so if we're yep. going back to this North Star of just like strong property rights, uh, anything that's not Ethereum DA is a is a is some sort of compromise on like one's property rights assurances because they're part of what they're doing is they're trusting something that's outside of the Loki of control that Ethereum has, right? Yep, yep, exactly. And it's also worth saying that like this kind of data withholding attack doesn't actually necessarily need to be malicious. You could have a situation where the alt DA layer just is unavailable for whatever reason. Like mm -hmm. let's just say it, it's an outage on Google Cloud and you know 90% of the validators are running in US East 1 and, and that results in no data being posted on the or finalized on the alt DA layer. And a really important piece here too is that not only does data need to be posted to this alt DA layer, but it also needs to be finalized, mm. right? So there's this kind of core core reality that like in order to to release the funds from the L1, if you're using an alt DA layer, you have to have finality of the the alternative chain in order to ensure that that you're not going to get a reversion of the the data that was posted there in the first place. So yeah, there's there's kind of huge amounts of complexity in engineering how these two chains work in parallel and also all of the fallback mechanisms between them when when one goes down or when one um, when one changes state. Okay, so we've talked about maybe a main reason why layer twos uh, need effectively in order to preserve Ethereum's level of uh, property rights guarantees, need to use Ethereum for both settlement and DA, data availability. Um, are there other reasons though? Not everyone in the world, Mike, is like us. I mean, they're not all... <laughs> how, not you know, everyone what is my, bankless, you know? <laughs> what are my property rights on this like particular <laughs> asset? Like they don't necessarily think of that. I think that the larger of an entity they, they are, the more assets that they might have if you're operating at the level of uh, an entire chain's worth of uh, assets then you're, you're definitely thinking about that but um, many people maybe aren't are there other reasons to tap into ethereum's da because there are those who would say look da is just kind of like nothing data availability is kind of like a commodity you know, even layer twos don't value it. Uh, you know, we'll have so much of it, it'll never drive the, the price of, of Ether. But are there network effects that would lock layer twos in aside from property rights? Yeah, so this is, this is a great question. And I think one that 
um, will continue to be discussed kind of as as we look forward and and is a very central part of the rope centric roadmap. So what we described before is kind of the longest time horizon version of network effects. And I guess we'll start by defining network effects as one rollup may choose to post their data to Ethereum blobs, to Ethereum DA, and benefit from the fact that other rollups are doing the same. Like that's kind of the fundamental premise of, of what provides property re- or what provides network effects to to consuming Ethereum. It, yeah, it's Metcalf's laws, like more participants in the yep. network, more valuable the network is for all the participants. It's a right. blob party. All the blobs are <laughs> blob hanging party. out if they're all at the same party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So the the kind of first version we described, I would say, is this is what Sriram calls trustless composability, which is kind of at the core, the assets on all of these L2s have the same trust substrate, which is Ethereum's property rights. Now that's that's super valuable. And I think we th- this is kind of what you described as like the super cypherpunk mentality around around L2 assets. Now, on the far other end of the time spectrum, and this is kind of like the potential end game that's most exciting, and this is what Justin often calls universal synchronous composability, you could imagine a world where the network effects arise of having basically immediate and trustless interop between roll-up states. So this world kind of depends on a few things. I would say you need um, shared sequencing and you need real-time proving where, you know, not only are multiple roll-ups being sequenced by the same entity, but they're also generating ZK proofs about the state kind of sub-slot. Like within 200 milliseconds of me creating a transaction, I have a proof. I can send that proof to the sequencer and, and kind of atomically move my assets between chains even within a single Ethereum slot. Mm. So this is kind of like the the kind of long-term future of like how um, cross-chain interoperability could work, especially at the real-time level. And the reason this would provide network effects is, is kind of the classic argument of basically this turns all of Ethereum block space into a shared state because now you have access to all the liquidity across all the chains. You know, DeFi pools can be balanced and, and arbed and you you get kind of, by not being part of this, you lose all of the access to that value and to the interoperability and all the MEV that gets generated from being part of the the kind of block blob party that we described earlier. So now we're actually creating a, a reason for decentralizing the sequencers. Like we we established earlier in the conversation, hey, maybe they're not incent L2s are not incented to decentralize their sequencers because of the, you know, they're reselling block space and they extract fees on top of that. And the business model is kind of uh, you know, MEV. But now we're creating sort of a reason, which is basically, hey, if you want to tap into this trade network of all of these layer twos interoperating and the shared liquidity pool. Then you're gonna want it, you're gonna need to decentralize your sequencers, right? And so maybe that gives them the incentive to actually take this next step and you, like create a union of these chains, a, a deeper economic network. Yeah, I think one important distinction here is the difference between a shared sequencer and a decentralized sequencer. You could have a world where there's a single shared sequencer that is centralized and still oh, is able okay. to do all this cross-chain atomicity stuff. Mm. But um, yeah, obviously. There, I think most versions of a, a shared sequencer are pitched as decentralized or kind of a more decentralized than a single box running in like US East 1. And so I, I think that that world could also be totally in play. Now, I also want to be able to kind of look at the middle time horizon, which is, you know, not as long term as this kind of trustless composability, not as short term as this universal synchronous composability, but more in the medium term. I'm calling it maybe like, the human time horizon, which is I don't necessarily need like 200 millisecond um, trading between all these chains. Let's just say I want to like, I have some money on Optimism mainnet and I want to bridge it to Arbitrum and I want to do that trustlessly. Like maybe I'm willing to wait like one or two Ethereum blocks. Obviously, I don't want to wait like several weeks. I don't want to have to go through the long flow. But uh, one way that Ethereum DA could enable this trustless kind of human time horizon interop is through the the non-force withdrawal flow, the the kind of standard offboarding flow. So kind of walk walk with me through this thought experiment here, which is um, imagine we ha- we're in a world where there's ZK rollups and they can prove the ZK EVM blocks within a single slot. So we're not saying they need to be able to do it in like 100 milliseconds. We're saying they have like the full 12 seconds to do so. Now, 
I want to use the normal, like, let's say I'm not being uh, censored by the sequencer. So I want to do the normal flow of just like, I have money on Arbitrum. I want to bridge it down and into Ethereum and then up into Optimism to buy an NFT there. Like super simple flow. Um, I don't necessarily want to wait the, or I guess, yeah, this this wouldn't work with the Arbitrum and Optimism example because those are optimistic rollups, but we need a ZK rollup that I have my money in that I need to bridge out of. Now, if the rollup prover can prove my transaction is valid within 12 seconds, then I know that during the next slot, I can have my assets on the Ethereum L1 and then bridge them into the, the next rollup I want to transition to. However, this is only possible if that ZK rollup posts the proof to an Ethereum blob. <laughs> the reason for this is because if the proof is on a different, uh, different alt DA chain, then all of the things I was describing where you rely on the alt DA chain's fork choice rule come into play. So I'd have to wait until that alt DA chain finalizes. And there's all these trust assumptions around kind of if that chain has a safety violation or a liveness error, then all of this kind of like same slot or next slot interoperability goes away unless you're using Ethereum DA. So I like to think of this as kind of just the kind of default flow, making it so good that I don't need to use like a market maker to bridge between two L2s. I can do it trustlessly. I don't need to do it in 100 milliseconds. I can do it in like 12 seconds. And maybe this tech is ready in like the next one to two years instead of being ready in the next like two to four years. So that's kind of one medium term time horizon thing that I think is is really underexplored. And um, yeah, again, this is this is for the with the withdrawal flow that isn't through the forced inbox. This is just like the normal withdrawal flow from uh, a, a ZK rollup. This is getting into the conversation of, of course, Ethereum, broad, broad Ethereum network composability and using Ethereum as an inclusive of its uh, inclusive of its layer twos. Uh, and I, th I think something uh, the, the perspective here is that like since we are doing the very hard work of having strong property right, rights assurances across all of these layer twos, we are now figuring out mechanisms to compose the Ethereum layer twos without sacrificing the strong property rights here. And we've come to this idea of like the blob party where all these blobs, again, are hanging out, different blobs from different layer twos and layer twos can read other layer twos blobs. And that is what gives property rights assurances across layer twos. These are now chains that are reading the property rights of a different layer two in order to have a cross layer two, like almost a, yeah, atomic transaction between different networks. Uh, and it kind of starts from there. And then it, it sounds like it, there's a path to get this even faster and faster and faster as time goes on. But like in your, what you're kind of saying is in the short to medium term, one, one to two years, you'll have uncompromised property rights inside of one Ethereum slot inside of 12 seconds that goes across uh, the Ethereum layer two landscape. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And I think there's a path dependence thing here, which is if we never, like if we immediately got to a place where blob space became so overpriced and so congested kind of right mm -hmm. out of the box that the default path was for teams to, to use alternative DA, then there's a world where like the Overton window has shifted too far and like getting people to actually use Ethereum blobs is, is impossible. But we're in a pretty cool position now, which is we've shipped blobs and they're not immediately at capacity, right? And Vitalik had a tweet about this two days ago, which is, you know, it's only been since April, it's been four or five months since Ethereum blobs have actually gone live and we we still have like abundant block uh, blob space. And so this kind of, dovetails nicely with the vision of like, hey, we should make Ethereum blobs the default choice, not only from a security perspective, but also just from an engineering perspective. You don't have to rely on this external system. And just from like, kind of from the get-go, L2 teams shouldn't have to make the decision about where they post their blobs, just making Ethereum the, the de facto choice and keeping it the de facto choice as we like ramp into kind of mainstream adoption feels like the correct like strategic positioning for Okay, so for like in order to get that network effect, we need to we need to create the network effect around uh Ethereum blob space and Ethereum DA. And so it's it's kind of good that it's super cheap for layer twos mm -hmm. from that perspective. Cause we're we're munching on market share. We gotta eat up all the market share in order During to create penetrative these, pricing. Yeah. <laughs> in order to get this network effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, this this does kind of take us nicely into thinking about DA fees and um kind of how this plays into 
the long-term value accrual to ETH asset. And one, one really nice um, kind of back of the napkin math we can do on this is just to say, okay, let's say Ethereum blob scaled to the level that, that we kind of think is possible with full dank sharding, right? So if we're at that point where we have like around 128 blobs per block, then uh, Francesco did some calculation and showed that we could get to the place of maybe having two gigagas per second, right? So this means on L2s, two billion gas per second can be created of transactions and stored on Ethereum blobs, right? Like that's kind of the metric that that we're setting the stage for. You're talking about with, right now or with no, that, that's full dank sharding? Full, full dank sharding. And yeah. what kind of an increase would that be if people are not used to the giga gas, gas <laughs> uh, u- unit of measurement here? Is like, is that, is this, are we talking a, a hundred X or is this a thousand X? It's yeah, two orders of magnitude. Okay. Of, of more scale on the Ethereum layer twos. And we haven't even hit the upper limits of our current levels of scale on, on layer twos right now. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's two so, orders of magnitude of a current level that we have not currently met in, in total transactional demand on layer twos. With right. full dank sharding. With full dank, right sharding. With full dank sharding. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of like, you know, looking into the future, what, what could this like actual volume of, of transactions look like and how would that play into the kind of monetary properties of ETH asset. So once we get to 128 blobs per block, which is kind of the, the upper bound that we expect to be possible while kind of preserving the same level of decentralization of the, of the validator set, we, we think that like the block space will be so abundant and kind of so useful that there'll be kind of no reason for L2s not to use Ethereum blobs and the ability to really trust that if you build an L2 application that goes super viral, like you're not, you're going to keep DA fees. DA fees are going to be reasonable enough that you can kind of build whatever you want and and deploy it and know that you still get the Ethereum um, property rights and censorship resistance of building on a, a rollup. Okay. All right. So that that basically what you just described is the Ethereum roadmap is just like to continue uh, scaling up the DA for these layer twos. It's ro- roll up centric. And as they migrate from, you know, optimistic layer twos to ZK layer twos, the blob space on Ethereum will be abundantly cheap and they won't need to go to a thir- third party non-Ethereum, uh, you know, DA provider. They'll just stay on Ethereum because it's uh, ultra cheap. All of this makes sense so far, except, and here's maybe the the, the gap in the armor here. Uh, what happens though, Mike, if the pri- if the value of ETH, the price of ETH drops to zero, okay? Maybe I'm being hyperbolic here, okay? Like I am purposely so. The entire uh, foundation of this economic system that we're creating, the shared security, uh, is dependent on the value of Ether, the asset. And so this is the other point that detractors are making with this... Um, Road, uh, roll-up centric roadmap is like what you are destroying is a value accrual mechanism for Ether, the asset. You create abundant block space and we can already see it. In, you go to ultras, ul, ultrasound money uh, charts, right? we are burning less Ether than we had been historically after the deployment of cheaper blob space. And so it's losing that cash flow property. If, if bankless listeners recall, we, we've mentioned it a few times in this episode, but the basis of the, the triple point asset value accrual mechanism for, for Ether is threefold, right? Like one is uh, it's used as a commodity. So in order to buy block space, you need Ether the asset, right? So it's like, you know, the value of block space as priced in Ether, that's one dimension of the, the value that that um, flows to Ether. Another dimension is cash. Uh, it's, it's a cash flowing asset. So it's a productive asset. So basically um, cash flows that are generated from the purchase of, of block space accrue, accrue to ETH holders as well. And the third dimension that may be the most difficult to uh, define is a store of value, right? These are the three dimensions. What we're doing when we make blob space really cheap for DAs is we destroy that capital asset dimension. We destroy the cash flow coming into Ether, the, the asset, at least in the short term, maybe in the medium term, but like maybe as distractors say, maybe forever, maybe layer twos are the ones that reap all of the benefit from this transaction activities. And so we create these really fat, really profitable layer two juggernauts that, oops, oh, they're centrally controlled by uh, Coinbase governance, let's say, and shareholders that 
uh, own coin and Brian Armstrong. And he's a good guy, right? We all like Brian, but like, what if he turns <laughs> evil or what if he leaves and somebody else, you know, uh, usurps Coinbase? And so that that is the entire problem. What if through this roadmap, we are like chipping away at the the value proposition of Ether, the, the asset. So let's talk about that now. <laughs> what is the the value of Ether, the asset, if we uh, carry forward the, this roll-up centric roadmap? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question. And I think it's, it's very much part of this conversation as evidenced by, it's the main thing that people are focusing on, you know, when the Twitter discourse was happening around the roll-up centric roadmap, it was basically like centered on this idea of, okay, what about the revenue? What about the fees? But in my article, I intentionally put this kind of farther down because I do think it's it's like not the number one thing we should be focused on, but it is a conversation worth having. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're having it. So yeah, I guess first and foremost, I think of, I, I think the triple point asset thesis is like a very useful framework for thinking about things. And in my mind, ETH as, as money, ETH as kind of a store of value asset is, is the primary driver of its, of its value. Now, and, and kind of ETH as, as a consumable, ETH as a utility asset is also like clearly going to be the case as, you know, DA fees have to be paid in ETH. There's kind of like this long-term vision of businesses and, and individuals holding ETH to pay for gas on the Ethereum L1 and it pay for Ethereum blobs. Now we get to kind of this, um, this capital asset thing. And I guess I'll start by saying I don't fundamentally see ETH's value as Corely dependent on it being net deflationary. Like okay. I do think, I do think it's important to to have um, kind of strong assurances around the supply and around the inflation schedule. But I don't think in the aggregate, like in the infinite time horizon, it has to be net deflationary. Um, so yeah, I guess starting there, it feels important to me. Now talking about, um, I'll first talk about L one execution, and then I'll talk about. Uh, blob fees, because those are the kind of two ways that the Ethereum network counteracts the inflation, right? So inflation comes from the issuance schedule, which is how validators are paid for participating in consensus. And fundamentally, like that's just the new set of Ether that's minted every every 12 seconds, every 32 slots, you know, that's kind of everyone's, everyone's on the same page about that curve. Now, how is... Um, how does L1 execution play into this? This is through the 1559 mechanism. The base fee is burned. And in regards to L1 execution, I still do think even if you know most user activity takes place on the L2s, there still will remain in like high value transactions that do take place on the Ethereum L1. And I kind of like to use the mental model. I think maybe you guys have used it before, or like maybe even I got it from you guys. But the idea of L1 is kind of like a B2B chain, right? Mm. Like People who are very price insensitive will use the L1 to to do transactions. Um, you know, maybe it's very deep liquidity for for trading assets, even though most of the users are like doing their trading at, at a different dimension. Maybe it's you know where the the pristine NFT drops happen, and there's still like massive amounts of congestion when those the CryptoPunk 2.0 gets dropped. Um, but fundamentally, like I view the ecosystem of economic activity that kind of all funnels down to Ethereum L1 as resulting in invaluable transactions going to happen on the L1. And, and that um, that feels like kind of a core thing to start with. Now, if we take L1 base fee out of it completely, L1 execution base fee out of it completely, we can do some back of the napkin math upon how much the blob fees would have to burn in order for the if to offset the Ethereum issuance kind of in isolation. So now we're saying, okay, throw Ethereum execution completely out of the picture. Let's only consider how much burn happens as a result of blobs and how much in particular L2 activity has to pay in order to offset that inflation, right? So the, the setup here is right now we have about 1 million Ether issued per year at the current rates. This is with 30% um, of Ether staked, which is about 33 million Ether, and 3% um, yield leads to about 1 million Ether staked per year. So that's at you know $2,500 ETH, that's 2.5 billion US dollars of issuance every year from the Ethereum side, uh, from the Ethereum uh, consensus layer, right? So now if you look at how much blobs would have to pay, and we're kind of looking forward into the, the world of full dank sharding. So let's say there's 128 blobs per block. 
And we're going we're gonna to do a unit conversion here, which is taking that the blobs per block and converting it into gas, because gas is the unit of account in which transactions are measured um, on, on L2s. So, you know, Francesco has this post, I, I mentioned it earlier, but basically we expect that to be around two gigagas, to, so two billion gas per second of L2 block space. So now the question is, okay, we have $2.5 billion of issuance and we have two billion gigagas per second of L2 block space. How much do we have to pay for that block space how, like, in order for it to match that 2.5 billion? And if you do the math, this, this kind of turns out, turns out that if you consume all of the L2 gas with just simple transfers, so this is me just sending ETH from one address to another, that would be 0. $0.0008 dollars per transaction. So less than a tenth of a cent per transaction. And so the point here is these transactions are still dirt cheap, right? We're talking one tenth of a cent transaction fees, but we're still fully offsetting the Ethereum inflation if we fully consume this L2 block space. Now for swaps, it's it's closer to one cent, but it's just one more of, one more order of magnitude higher. So mm -hmm. the idea here is you can still get one cent swaps and one tenth of a cent base fee or transfers on the L2s. So like dirt cheap transaction fees while still kind of burning enough ether to counteract the inflation of the Ethereum issuance. So yeah, thanks for being with me through that. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's like uh, in your estimation with the L2 roadmap, um, Ether as a cash flowing asset as a result of you know, like uh, burning fees from uh, you know, contentious excess uh, blob space use is not the main value accrual mechanism for Ether. The main value accrual mechanism is basically ETH as money, ETH as a, a store of value asset. Um, some people hear that and still don't understand or believe why that would be the case. So more L2s, more economic activity on L2s, L2s being able to uh, charge kind of like rent uh, on the block space that they are reselling to users. They understand how layer twos might accrue value, but why does it hold that Ether the asset would increase in its use as a money, store a value use case, if all of these layer twos settle on Ethereum and uh, also use Ethereum for data availability? Are we just like, what, what is that kind of logic leap? Are we just kind of like hoping and praying? We're just kind of crossing our fingers. We're just thinking, okay, well, the one thing all of these layer twos in common have is they're all using uh, Ethereum for DA and settlement. And the one asset that can flow across them in a pristine, you know, uh, censorship resistant way is Ether the asset. Therefore, Ether the asset will be a key pillar of all of these layer two economies. And therefore, Ether the asset will increase in terms of its uh, use as money and store of value capability. Like there's a, there's a few sort of dots there that I'm not yep. sure that we're connecting. We're almost like taking it on faith. And that's what, that's what it sounds like when you try to describe this to uh, doubters and haters of the L2 roadmap. <laughs> so uh, like, do you have any more detail on this or is this sort of like what we're, what we're counting on and hoping for? Yeah, I think ETH as money, um, these, these discussions are kind of by definition more loose because as David mentioned earlier, like money is kind of hard to define and, and mimetic in, in its own right. Like it's kind of a faith-based system that the US dollar has value um, kind of. So mon monetary premium is something that, you know, we hope will, will accrue to the ETH asset, but it is harder to make like picture, you know, like super bulletproof claims about it because it's, it's a fuzzier concept. But I money think- Money is yeah. just simply not objective. It's not like, objective. Yeah, it's, it's a squishy, <laughs> very subjective subject. Yeah, uh, and I intersubjective. Think like, inter, yeah, it's, it's intersubjective. That's great. That's great. <laughs> As you all would say, in yeah. the uh -huh. the pod was great. Uh, so yeah, I think there's there's a few things that that are worth kind of hammering on here. One is um, kind of these other pro properties of money that are often talked about. One is like the medium of exchange and the unit of account. So I do think there is value in the norm that the L2s will use Ethereum as a, a gas token, right? And the reason for that is it because it increases the kind of latent demand for people to hold the Ether asset itself because they know they need to use it to interact with the L2. So this is almost like um, extending ETH's utility 
to the L2s and kind of imbuing it with that um, unit of account property that that is that makes it more attractive to hold in the first place. Now, everyone's like, oh, but the L2 tokens are going to be replacing ETH as the L2 gas token. I think it's not actually so clear, right? And And the reason for that is if I'm a user of an L2, I don't want to hold their token necessarily. Like, sure, the you know, the VCs who own the tokens might want you to own it. But as a as a user itself, they're themselves, like they probably want to hold the asset they actually have like the highest conviction on. And I don't think the L2 assets are going to be like substantially better or or kind of more convenient for them to hold than Ether itself. Um, and so it could actually be like a competitive disadvantage as an L2 to force your users to pay in your native token. Another thing that is is definitely worth saying here is kind of circling back to this idea of counterparty risk, right? So I think when people talk about um, programmable money, oftentimes they think of like USDC as, hey, this is just like the simplest idea of programmable money. You kind of put this dollar on chain and you can program it to do all this different stuff. But I don't really think you can have programmable money with this like this type of counterparty risk that exists and that we defined earlier. So I think ETH, as, as Ryan described, ETH is kind of the permissionless censorship resistant kind of shelling point of where value gets created, stored, and transmitted among the whole ecosystem. Like it does feel like a, a real clear cut candidate for becoming money in, in this world. And yeah, I, I think the unit of account stuff, or sorry, medium of exchange stuff is is maybe a little less clear. I still fully believe in the kind of the collateral thesis for Ether as collateral to mint truly decentralized stablecoins um, or stablecoins that aren't necessarily like pegged to the US dollar, but kind of like have lower volatility than Ether asset, but are still useful as kind of a daily medium of exchange for, for going and buying coffee. So I think these types of things are maybe mostly going to show up after a black swan event. For example, mm -hmm. if if there's a giant asset seizure of USDC or if Circle starts KYCing everyone who owns USDC or something like that, that could lead to a much more compelling reason to need decentralized stablecoins and, and need a way to store value on chain that doesn't have this counterparty risk. Um, and in my mind, that's the best candidate for creating the unit of account power that, that would also drive the monetary premium. Going back to some very early episodes of Bankless when we were exploring what money is in the first place, we inevitably came back down to that mimetic word of, well, at some point, like money is just what people believe it to be. Uh, and I think the way that this connects to the Ethereum roll-up centric roadmap, and especially with these like very large scalability numbers, when we talk about full dank sharding, 100, 128 blobs per slot, uh, two gigagas per second, uh, a bajillion transactions floating <laughs> around all of the Ethereum layer two space. Uh, the way that I'll, I'll connect this with that these ideas of like what money is, is that when so many chains spawn and we find like roll up as a service providers find ways to spin up a random chain for like this gaming event that happens on some like gaming chain or something and we have another big chain happening over here we have a third big chain happening we have so many chains a million chains there's a lot of people making a lot of bets on like a, a millions of chains being birthed when all of these spawn from a, the property rights the strong property rights systems that comes out of the ethereum layer one all of those are secured by ethereum that mimetic surface area goes from what was previously ultrasound money, the burn, the metrics that we kept on looking at for 2021, 2022, which those metrics aren't exactly looking so great right now. And perhaps that's related to some of the despair felt in the ETH BTC ratio, the ETH community, <laughs> because what we're doing is we're doing the Indiana Jones thing of like swapping out burn with this grand property rights system, which is not here yet. Like we have a pretty good number of rollups, but we do not have a million rollups. And a million rollups represents surface area, just mimetic surface area for Ether the asset and the strong property rights that it carries with it to float around this property rights system, this, this ledger system going all around the internet. Uh, and we're in this, this moment of time in which like people are evaluating the Ethereum rollup centric roadmap. And I think Ryan put it really well is, is, uh, and I'll, I'll pose the question that he kind of put in his tweet is like, is the Ethereum roll-up centric roadmap a queen sacrifice for the victory or is it a queen sacrifice blunder? 
And right now people are kind of like, is it a blunder or is it a, or is it just like the end game? Uh, and I think this episode is kind of alluding to like, well, no, this is a, we're, we're sacrificing the execution on the layer one. We're, we're sacrificing capturing DA fees because DA is a commodity and we're scaling it even beyond that. And yet what we, what do we get out of this? We get, our, we get out such a Cambrian explosion of abundant, secure block space that we can actually bring the whole entire universe now and in the future on chain in a strong property rights, internet sovereign way. And I think that is the meme of ETH as money uh, articulated perhaps in this like Ethereum roll-up centric roadmap. Yeah, I, you know, I think the real blunder would be if we just stuck our head in the sand and and decided not to have the conversation at all. So I'm really thankful that like people are pushing back and and we're reevaluating. And I I don't think this episode will be the the nail in the coffin on on either side of the debate. But I do think it's it's worth like fundamentally evaluating you know the roll up centric roadmap and and make sure we're on a path towards what we think is the correct outcome. So yeah. So, so Mike, I, I guess your message today or your take on all of this is stay the course with the current roadmap, right? In, the in Ethereum of, roadmap is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of prioritizing for settlement and uh, DA and execution, uh, that's the first piece. And if we prioritize those things and layer twos are successful in creating economic GDP, then that will lead to Ether, the asset, accruing continuous uh, monetary premium, particularly as a store of value across the entire layer two economy. Th that's kind of the summary, and that's sort of the take in response to some of the recent roadmap critiques that we've been hearing. Is that is that a good summary? Yeah, that's a great summary. And I also think it's it's totally true that Ethereum is supercharged by diversity of thought, right? And having so many people invested in Ethereum's base layer and so many people kind of working to to build out this this future internet economy is is part of what makes Ethereum great and I hope that you know this discussion encourages people to engage more and and think through it and also um the roll up teams you know who are contributing to the to the base layer continue to like have the same vision and goals for for what Ethereum's trying to do all right. Well, may the conversation continue, and I'm sure it will. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Guys, got to let you know, of course, you know, crypto is risky. So is Ethereum. So our roadmaps, all of these things are risky. Or but we are, Yes. <laughs> sorry. Queen sacrifices? <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about with respect to chess, David. You know better. But this is the that frontier. Was, it was correct term. <laughs> it's not for everyone. But we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 